Welcome to Summit's Online Encounter. Our mission is to provide locations where people like you can have life-changing experiences with God. This is one of those locations. We also gather each week as a church in the heart of St. Paul. As disciples of Christ, we are doing our best to be on mission, deliver hope, and champion this city. At any point in your journey, if you want to take the next steps, or you just want to stay in the loop with everything going on at Summit, just grab your phone and simply text the phrase, Be Known, to 651-360-2908. We'll send you a short form. Please complete it so that you can be known in our Summit family. One of the ways to grow your faith is through worship. Worship with our lives in serving and worshiping Jesus with a song. We have pre-recorded some music in our sanctuary to create a place for you to worship with us virtually. So focus in, give way to the space needed, and invest some time in worshiping Jesus.
systems that's important to following Jesus is studying scripture. As we study the Bible, we can have hope, find guidance, be corrected, and receive truth into our lives. Let's open God's word and hear this week's message. But uh, over the last, I don't know how many, I guess we're 10 weeks in now, right? We've been walking through the book of Hebrews uh, for the summer, and Pastor Eric and I have been kind of sharing that workload back and forth, and it's been a, a ton of fun. Uh, right now, uh, Pastor Eric and his family are out somewhere in the Pacific Northwest, enjoying a little vacation time, a little time away. So if you have his cell phone number, uh, do me a favor and just forget that you have it for like a week. <laughs> let, let him have the break for a week, or just say, hey, we love you and miss you. That's it. How's that sound? That sound good? Uh, but no, I'm really hopeful that him and his family are able to connect out there and uh, really get some uh, relaxation and restoration as they get ready to come back for the fall. But yeah, we, so we've been walking through this book of Hebrews, and I will tell you, I have a newfound appreciation for this book. Uh, just the theological powerhouse of the author of this book. And we, you've heard Pastor Eric say, we don't know if it was a he or a she. There is some evidence to suggest that it was a Priscilla that wrote uh, Hebrews or Paul. Uh, the reality is it's likely an author who was, e- it was either Paul or somebody very close to Paul. Therefore, Priscilla would make a good point. That's why you'll hear us or him refer to he or she to the author uh, that came up the other day. I just wanted to kind of clarify why, why that's being said. Because there's some evidence that it could be, could be that. Uh, But I could not do justice to the last nine weeks of Hebrews to give you a review. So the best way to do that is to head over to the website, uh, to jump on the YouTube channel, or to go to our podcast, Life in the Valley, and just listen back to the ones that maybe you have missed, or maybe if you want to just go back to hear them again. That's a great place to do it. If you don't have the app yet, I'm just telling you, the app is the easiest way to get it. You can just go onto that main page, click one button, and you're right into uh, where the sermon content is. So if you don't have the app, go ahead and grab that. Yeah, it'll be good for you. But last week, so Eric talked through Hebrews chapter 9. And the big thing on Hebrews t- chapter 9 was connecting the covenants, the Old Testament covenants with the New Covenant. So he, he walked through all that. If you need to go back to that, do that. But he's really focused on the Mosaic Covenant, the one that was established through Moses, and Jesus was the one that came and fulfilled. He was the perfect fulfillment of that old covenant. And so in other words, Jesus is also the perfect covenant because he's the new covenant, the place that we live. What's a covenant? It's a binding. It's not like an agreement, like a contract. A covenant goes much deeper than that. Uh, It wasn't like, well, as long as you do these things, I'll do this. A covenant is really God saying, I'm going to do this. That's it. I don't know how you're going to respond, but this is what I'm going to do. And what that covenant was in Christ is he gave his son so that we may have life. That was the covenant he created. If you will submit to Jesus, you get life. I will do, my covenant to you is to give you a way to me. Now we can argue about whether or not we think that's fair, that you have, that Jesus is the only way. We can make that argument to go, oh, I don't know if that's super fair, but I, I just look at it this way. God didn't have to make a way at all. And he chose out of his love to make a way. So I say, thank you, Jesus, for making a way to you. Because without you, I would not be able to get into the arms of the Father. And I love the way that the author of Hebrews closes out Hebrews 9 in this way. He says this. So also Christ, having been offered once to bear the sin of many, will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Our reality is Jesus has given us the opportunity to wait on him to come back. He's coming back again. We all know that he is going to return, but he's not coming again to bear that weight of sin. Instead, he's going to bring with him that usher of salvation for those of us who have said yes to Jesus. That's the new reality that we get to live into today. That is the new place that we get in. So here's my hope. My hope is that that's true for you. My hope is that you realize that Jesus has made a way for you to have a relationship with God now to wait for his second return. And that that salvation will be finalized upon his return. That's my hope. My hope is you're patiently waiting, some less patient, but that you're patiently waiting on the Lord's 
return and that you have hope and that you have power and that you have rejoicing and that you have joy in that moment. But if I'm honest, my guess is most of us don't feel that way. Is that true? Like sometimes day-to-day life kind of gets in the way and we don't always feel the joy that we want to feel. We, all, we don't always remember that we're waiting patiently on the Lord, that he has empowered us to live for him. And sometimes we forget all of that and we let the muck and the mire of the world weigh us down and get a little heavy for us. Well, here's what my hope is. My hope is we go through Hebrews 10 together that the author is going to give us some encouragement to learn what it means to live in Christ. What does that mean for us practically speaking? How can we actually live in Christ? That's what I'm hoping for. That's where I'm hoping that he will bring us to. So we're going to begin in Hebrews chapter 10. If you brought your Bible, that's where you're going to want to turn to. It's always a good idea to bring a Bible. If you didn't bring your Bible, you probably have a personal flat screen and there's likely a Bible in there. Go ahead and turn it to that. Or you can follow along on the screen because we'll, we'll have those up as well. All right, Hebrews 10, 1 to 4. Since the law has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the reality itself of those things, it can never perfect the worshipers by the same sacrifices they continually offer year after year. Otherwise, wouldn't they have stopped being offered since the worshipers, purified once and for all, would no longer have any consequences or consciousness of sins. But in the sacrifices, there is a reminder of sin year after year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Now last year or last week, Pastor Eric talked about how the temple workers used to be busy about all of the sacrificial system. They were constantly offering sacrifices in the areas of the tabernacle or the temple to atone for the sins of the people. But when Jesus came, he was the perfect priest and he rested. He sat at the right hand of the Father, and that sitting was a symbol of him ceasing that work of having to offer constant, continual sacrifices for the people. Why? Because, well, it was worthless. The blood of, and, but, uh, the blood of bulls and goats did nothing for them. They had to continue to offer it over and over and over again, and it really didn't cleanse them of anything. It just showed that they had hearts attuned to the Lord and they were willing to do as he commanded. Here's the interesting thing. It wasn't even that unique. Did you know that? The sacrificial system of of the, the Hebrew people where they were slaughtering animals, that really wasn't that unique to the Hebrew people. That was a pretty normal thing in the Near Eastern world. The ancient Near Eastern world, sacrifice with animals was just part of life. But God created a new way when he created Christ. And that's that's. What's in, when he created the moment of Jesus' uh, uh, resurrection, there's a new covenant that was formed. And that's what Eric was kind of talking about, was that we don't need these old sacrifices because Jesus, Jesus was the high priest that finished the priestly work. I don't, did you catch that last week? In the last couple of weeks we kind of talked over that. It was a shadow of it. How, how many of you are really good at shadow puppets? Anybody? Like, do you guys know what a shadow puppet is? Y'all are looking at me like I'm nuts. No? Okay, somebody knows what a shadow puppet is. Praise God. All right, so shadow puppet, right? Like, if you're a novice, you can probably do the dog. I think, I don't know. We could probably all do the dog. Uh, maybe if you're, if you're really an expert, maybe you could do the rabbit. Uh, maybe you could do the bird, not that bird. But that bird, that, that, that's pretty impressive. I'll just say, I, this is not me. <laughs> just so you know, this is the internet. That's, a, that's where these came from. But you guys know what I mean? Shadow puppets. Okay? Now, is a shadow puppet, is it, is it a good representation of the real thing? I mean, it's a representation of it, but a shadow puppet dog versus an a, a image of a dog is totally different. A shadow puppet rabbit as opposed to the image of the rabbit would be different, or the bird. A shadow puppet bird versus the image of a bird, and there is a slide for that. It's coming. There it is. We got there. But this, there's a distinct difference. He's saying the Old Testament was like a shadow of it. it. It showed to it, but it wasn't the reality. Now, here's the thing. There's a better reality even coming still. So just like there's a difference between the shadow 
in the real image. If I were really cool, I'd have brought my dog with me today. But I didn't want to deal with that, <laughs> just to be honest. But there's a big difference between the shadow of an image of a dog, an image, a, vi a visual image of a dog, and a real live dog. Well, right now we're living in the in-between. We're living in this opportunity for us to, to have a clearer picket, picture of what Jesus did for us. But here's what the author of 1 Corinthians, Paul, says this. In 1 Corinthians 13, 12, he said, For now we only see a reflection as in a mirror. But then face to face, now I know in part, but then I will know fully as I am fully known. So there's a reality for us today that it's, it's still just not quite the full picture of the, the presence of God that we will live into upon his second coming. When he returns to us, when he comes back to us to bring us in in that new salvation, guess what? It will be a totally different experience for us. And what we have today is like looking in a mirror. It's a mirrored image of it. It's not quite the whole picture. Do you see this progressive revelation of God that he's done throughout from the Old Testament being a shadow to the new covenant within Christ to the, the hope that we have for in the future is even better than what we have today. I feel like I'm losing some of you here, but that's the reality, right? Like it's this progressive revelation of Christ that he has provided for us. And here's what the author is saying in this first chunk of Hebrews as he's going through Hebrews 10. He is saying that Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. Just like Jesus was the perfect administer of the sacrifice as the priest, he also was the perfect sacrifice. So the priest could only do bulls and goats and doves and everything else. They could only sacrifice those animals. But Jesus came and said, I'm going to sacrifice myself both as perfect priest and as perfect sacrifice. And that perfect priesthood and that perfect sacrifice fulfilled the need for continual sacrifice. Like that's the truth of where we live today is we no longer have to make these offerings over and over and over again, the sacrificial system over and over again to somehow earn favor with God. Jesus completed all of that. Hebrews author, he quotes out of Psalm 40 here and he says this. Therefore, as he was coming into the world, he said, You did not desire sacrifice and offering, but prepared a body for me. You did not delight in the whole burnt offerings and sin offerings. And then I said, See, it is written about me in the scroll, I have come to do your will, God. Again, quoting from Psalm 40, the author is making a point that God never desired these sacrifices to begin with. Like I said, it was part and custom of the, old, of the old way of living. It was what they did in, the, in that near eastern ancient world. It's what they did. And he had to set up a system for them that they would understand. But that's never what he desired. What he desired was us. What he desired was us to come into his presence willfully and willingly. Hebrews 10, 8 through 9 or through 10 says this. After he says above, you did not desire or delight in sacrifices and offerings, whole burnt offerings and sin offerings, which are offered according to the law. He says then, <clears throat> see, I've come to do your will. He takes away the first to establish the second. By this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ, Jesus Christ, once and for all. If it was sacrifice God wanted... He would have just kept the old system. If it was a constant stream of sacrifice, he could have kept the old system. But he didn't desire that. He desired our hearts. He didn't desire our actions. He desired our hearts. And the only way to do that was for us to surrender them. That old system, we could just go through the, 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 the process of sacrifice they could just bring a lamb before the, the temple and say, Here, here's my sin sacrifice, and then go right back to sinning. They could bring their dove or their pigeon or their whatever, and they could say, oh, man, I, here, I need you to do this sacrifice. And then they could just go right back like nothing ever changed in their life. And that's not what God desired. He never desired for that, for us to just keep 
like going back and saying, oh, man, whoops, my bad, and then going right back, immediately back to where we were. That has never been his desire for us. What his desire was for us to, to turn from that, to see Jesus as the perfect sacrifice and say, I'm yours. I want to be with you. There's a freedom that's found in that. There's a, a freedom that happens in that. And this is what he says in 1014. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are sanctified. Whew. Think about that. Who's the one offering? Jesus. Through the singular offering of Jesus 2,000 years ago, the author of Hebrews is telling us, That he perfected the sanctified. How many of us feel like we live that reality? My guess is, my guess is most of us don't feel that way, that we have been perfected. So what do we do with that? Like, what are we supposed to do with the author of Hebrews is saying, Christ's sacrifice once and for all perfected the sanctified. And we don't feel it. Let me ask this question. Are you feeling like you're living in the shadow of freedom or the reality of freedom? Your life, if you were to look at your life, do you feel like you're in the shadow of freedom or that you're in that reality of living a freed life? It's a question we've got to ask ourselves. I, want a, I have to ask myself that. Does my life look like the one that's trapped in a shadow, like a shadow boxing match? Or have I been set free from fighting? And I've been able to just walk in Christ. Are we living in the shadow or are we living in the reality? For the Jesus followers in the room, here's the deal. That's not who you, like, we go back to the Old Testament way all the time. And we just say, we say things like this. And I just, I want to address it a little bit. Like, we say things like, well, I'm, I'm just a sinner. Thank God I'm saved by grace. Anybody ever said that? No shame. No shame. I've said it. Uh, why? Because why? Because like, if I had a pool on stage, I, this is what I should have done this too, but I didn't want to. But if I had a pool on stage, let's just imagine the rug is like a pool of sin. All right? And my whole life, this is, I'm just doing like the backstroke whoop, in the pool of sin. Just don't even know I'm wet. Just like living. And then all of a sudden one day somebody says, hey, uh, do you know that you're actually about to drown? And I'm like, what? I didn't know that. I'm getting a little tired. I don't know how long I can keep this up. And Jesus reaches in and grabs me. And he says, I'm going to put you on dry land. You were wet. What? I didn't know. How many of you had that revelation in your life? You're like, I didn't know I was in the pool of sin, but now I know I'm dry. But here's what happens. We make excuses for ourselves sometimes and we're like, Man, I'm just, a, I am a sinner saved by grace. And there was a day that was true for you, but if you've been saved by Jesus, you are no longer a sinner. That pool is no longer your home. This is. Where Christ has given you freedom is your new home, not that pool. You're free here. We don't need to give ourselves the excuse of going back to those sinful habits. Why? Because we have been given freedom in Christ. We, we have been given this freedom of, of not having to live the way we used to live. Like uh, The shadow of freedom looks like this. It's like managing sin. You ever lived like a sin management life? Well, all right, these are the list of things I can't do, so I better not do those things. And every time I do one of those, I've got I've to do these things now in order to get right for these things. That's the old, that's the shadow that's what they used to do in the Old Testament was, oh, man, I, I got to stay away from, I have to do or don't do these 613 things. And if I don't do them, then I got to do one of these who knows how many things in order to get back right with these things. That's the Old Testament. The New Testament way, the, new, the, new, the reality way, the shadow of living is living out of obligation. The reality way is living in response to grace. 
The shadow is like, I can't, I wrote these down. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read it from what I wrote because it will probably be better. The shadow of freedom is like sin management. It means like I have to fight like crazy to not do the sins of life. I have to fight to keep my act clean, to act the right way that I'm supposed to act. I have to fight not to drink that drink or to go to that website or to punch that dude in the face or to write that social media post or to fill in the blank. I have to fight like crazy not to do those things. But freedom is knowing that I'm holy in Christ. Is knowing that I actually have the power to put those things completely behind me. There's no fight there anymore. I can live for Christ. I don't have to worry about what I can't do. I worry about who I do it for. Do you see the difference? Sure, we're not going to do a whole list of things, but not because, not because they're on a list of our sin management techniques. But because we're not even going that direction anymore. We're so far away from the pool that the, it doesn't even tempt us. That's a process. But you've been given the power to live into it. Shadow is like serving out of, out of obligation. You serve your church, but you do it out of obligation. You feel the weight of, oh, man, there's other people that are serving. I better serve too. That's shadow. Uh, I, I, better, I better give because I know I'm supposed to, so I'm going to just do, I'm going to give the way I'm supposed to give. That, out of obligation and out of weight, that's shadow. That's living in the shadow of the Old Testament. I don't, I don't want us to live in that covenant. I want us to live in the reality of the new covenant. What does that look like? It looks like serving out of response to the grace I've been given. It looks like giving, starting it with even 10% and going above and beyond that. Why? Because it all belongs to God anyway. And I'm going to lead that from a perspective of grace. I'm giving in response to grace. I'm serving in response to grace. I'm living a different life in response to grace. Not out of obligation. Not out of some kind of mental checklist of what people said I should do. But I'm living in response to grace. That's real freedom. Real freedom is living in the freedom of the power of the Holy Spirit within you. And that's where the author goes. Hebrews 10, 15 to 18. The Holy Spirit also testifies about this. For after this he says, this is the covenant I will make with them. And those, after those days, the Lord says, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. And I will never again remember their sins and their lawless acts. Now where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. You see that? Everything that I've been talking about, the author is summing it up for us. He's proving it. He's saying, listen, you don't have to do those things anymore. You don't have to live that way anymore. You can live in response to grace because you've been forgiven and those things are done in your life. The problem is most of us have a hard time keeping up with it. We like that lifestyle. We like those things, whatever it was that we laid down, that we feel the grace God is drawing us into, and we have a hard time shedding it, so we give ourselves excuses. We don't have to give ourselves excuses anymore. We can live in the power of the Holy Spirit knowing that we can move forward in Him. And that's freedom. The shadow of the old covenant is living in the cage of I just can't be any different. That is the worst cage you could ever put yourself in. Well... I'm just a jerk. I guess I'll just be a jerk. I was born a jerk. I was raised a jerk. And I'm, I've grown up into the best jerk of all times. So I'm just going to continue being a jerk. And I'm just a jerk for Jesus. No. Right? No. That's not. That is not it. He, he took the jerk right out of you. He said, no. I, I, this is what I learned. When I met Jesus, I used to say to people, I was a jerk. <laughs> That's just true. I was, I was, and I would just say, oh, I'm just brutally honest. And then the Lord hit me and he's like, so, and sometimes it did feel like a punch. I'm just saying, I'm thick-headed. So I needed a little more than the holy elbow. I did a lot. He said, Chad, you can still be honest, but why are you so brutal? Take the brutality out of your honesty. I don't know, lead with love and grace and truth. Take the brutality out of it. That wrecked me. 
I had to go back to a whole list of people, and I'm like, man, I, I don't know. I don't know if you've forgiven me, but I want to ask for your forgiveness because I was, I was out of line with the way I used to be, and I, was, I, I said some things, and they might have been true what I said. How many of you know you can be right but wrong at the top of your voice? Thank you, Dr. Emerson Egerich or whatever. I think he's the one that coined that phrase. But I can be right, but I can be wrong at the top of my voice. Same thing. We don't have to be jerks for Jesus. We can be set free. Why? This is where the author takes all that we've gone through over the last nine weeks, and he's bringing it all together. He said, Jesus is the perfect theology. He's the perfect humanity. He's the perfect focus. He's the perfect rest. He's the perfect priest. He's the perfect promise. He's the perfect advocate. He's the perfect intercessor. He's the perfect covenant provider. Whew. Did you write all that down? No. I wouldn't either. That was a lot. But Jesus is perfect in all of those ways. So what is he saying to us? Jesus being all of those things means Jesus is the perfect life change. What he offers to us is a new life, a new way of being. Change equals change. I know it, like Pastor Eric talked about last time, sometimes change doesn't always look like change. And the reality is it's not fast. I, don't, I know I did not change fast enough for other people. I didn't change on their timeline. But I changed on God's timeline. There are things in your life that God is working on that other people wish you worked on faster. That's true. <laughs> Sorry to burst your bubble. I know that's true for me. I, there's definitely some people going, I mean, you've been a pastor now for how long? Why? Why do you? But Jesus changes our lives for the better every single time. So maybe you're going, all right, PC, this is all great. I'm supposed to live a great life. I'm supposed to live this way. I'm supposed to live in the freedom of this new reality in Christ. But what? how do I do that? Like I have been trying. You don't even know how hard I've been trying. And my life still is difficult. And I keep going back to the same pool over and over and over again. What? In the world, should I do different? What can I do? How do I move forward? Hebrews 10, 19 to 20. He gives us some helpful ideas around this. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, he has inaugurated for us a new living and a way through the curtain that is through his flesh. Do you guys remember last week Pastor Eric talked about how there's only certain people that could go into that holy of holy region and they had to like tie a rope around their ankle just in case they dropped dead in there, they could drag that dead body out of there? Talk about hazardous working conditions. <laughs> Sheesh, you think your job's tough. <laughs> you don't even know. The, I want to just talk about what the temple part, the torn veil is. Because there might be some of you in the room that don't know this. And so I just want to give an opportunity to help explain this to you, what this veil conversation is all about. There was a veil that separated the Holy of Holies from the, like, the, temp, the temple place. There's a part in the temple that only certain people could go in. It started in Exodus 26, 33. It said this, hang the curtain under the clasps and bring the ark of the testimony there behind the curtain. So the curtain will make a separation for you between the holy place and the most holy place. So there's a difference. This is a holy place where a lot of the sacrifices happen, but on this side is where the Ark of the Covenant was. This side was the holiest place. It's where God was going to show up, and if you entered in there in the wrong way, you were dead as soon as you did it. That's what he's taught. There's a veil between the two. But check this out. It was only certain people could go in there. Even Aaron, this is what Aaron, if you don't know, Aaron was the Levitical priest that started all of the priesthood. He was the brother of Moses. He was the first one that established the line of priests. And he couldn't go into that temple. He couldn't go into that part whenever he wanted. Check this out. Leviticus 16.2, the Lord said to Moses, tell your brother Aaron that he may not enter. He may not come whenever he wants into the holy place behind the curtain in front of the mercy seat on the, on the ark or else he will die because I appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. This is Aaron. Aaron can't go in at whenever he wants and yet Jesus tore the veil and gives you and me an opportunity to go into his presence any time that we want. 
Old Testament shadow, New Covenant reality. If you don't know how that all tore down, let me, let me just show you Matthew 27. So here's, what's how, here's where we're at in Matthew at this point. Jesus has already been arrested. He's hanging on the cross. He's crying out to God. He's being mocked by the soldiers. There's a spectacle that's being made. It's been dark for hours, and he's crying out to the Lord. And then this, Matthew 27, 50 to 51. But Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and gave up his spirit. Whew. Suddenly. The curtain of the sanctuary was torn from the top to the bottom. The earth quaked and the rocks were split. That veil that separated, that only certain people could go in at certain times, separated from the top to the bottom. And yes, there's a ton of symbolism in that. We don't have time to go into all that symbolism. but There's a ton of symbolism into that. But what's the reality is that we can have a boldness to enter into the presence of God because Jesus made that possible. So have confidence to do it. You want to know how to live a life in the new covenant free reality of freedom? Have the confidence to enter into the presence of God every day. Hebrews 10, 21 to 23, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and in full assurance of faith. With our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and with our bodies washed in pure water, let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering since he who is promised is faithful. So how do we walk in this new reality of freedom? I'm going to give you five things. If you're taking notes, this is a great time to do it. I'm, probably, I'm not putting them on the screen to the end, but they will get up on the end. So if you're going to snap a picture, that's the time to do that at the end. You ready for these? We're going to kind of go quick because I don't want to hold you till whenever, but let's, let's roll. So what do we do? How do we walk in this new reality? Be bold and draw near to God. The veil has been torn so you can enter into his presence. So what are you waiting for? Enter into his presence through worship. Enter into his presence through prayer. Enter his, into his presence through like that submission of saying, Jesus, I need you. Start your day on your knees. Or maybe say that prayer of, Lord, today's been a good day. I haven't sinned today. I haven't offended anybody today. God, thank you that I have not said the wrong thing, done the wrong thing, looked the wrong way, been the wrong way. Praise God. But in a moment, I'm going to take my feet and I'm going to put them on the floor as I get out of bed. And I just need to know that you're with me for the rest of the day. Maybe that's the place you start every day. Enter into the presence of God. Be bold to think differently. We are not as autonomous as we think we are. We are so influenced by the culture, it's ridiculous. They can tell us what to buy, and guess what? you got a craving to go buy it. They can tell us what to think, and we're like, well, this is the right way. We, we are so susceptible to the influence of everybody else that we need to be bold enough to think different. And it starts by entering the presence of God into his word, into prayer into worship. You see how these connect? So be bold enough to think differently and then allow that boldness to think differently to manifest in your body so you are bold enough to live differently. You don't have to live like everybody else expects you to live. You can live in the freedom that Christ offers you. Start in his presence. Be bold to think different. And allow those thoughts to permeate in your life so that you live different. And then be bold to keep the faith. All of this comes from that passage. Be bold enough to keep the faith even in the sight of those who are going to argue against you. Because <clears throat> you will face opposition. You will face a time when people are going to tell you, you can't think that way. You can't believe that. That's not right. You shouldn't be offended. You shouldn't be whatever for Christ. Listen, by the way, 
if we are offended in the spirit, we don't have to vindicate. God will do the vindicating. We can allow him to do it. We can offer it up to him that we feel offended, but we don't need to make a mess out of it. We can just say, all right, Lord, I, I believe if, I, if you're as offended as I am, you just tell me what you want me to do and I'll follow your way. But I, you don't need my help getting vindicated. You can do the hard work. <clears throat> I'll just be here for you. Be bold to keep the faith in our confession. Don't waver. Don't waver in your faith in Christ because he has never wavered over you. Be bold in your faith. And finally, how do we live into this freedom? Hebrews 20, 10, 24 to 25. And let us consider one another. I love this verse. In order to provoke love and good works. You want to you think differently and act differently? And have a confession of faith, a witness of your faith that's going to impact the lives around you? Provoke love and good works. By considering one another. Not neglecting the gathering together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see that final day approaching. So what is number five? Number five is be bold together. We are much stronger together than we are apart. We need to be bold together. We need to be bold as we go into the presence of God on a daily, regular basis. We need to be bold to think differently with our lives. We need to be bold enough to live differently with our lives. We need to be bold enough to have a conviction of faith to stand firm in that faith. And we need to be bold to do it together even when it's hard. Even when, but they don't believe, they don't think the same way I do politically. Love them anyway. But, 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 but they don't see this, this way. Good, love them anyway. But they don't do like this. Love them anyway. We need to be bold enough to stay together, to be unified together, to let that move us towards loving, kind acts towards one another. Hope that was practical. I hope that was helpful. As you continue into Hebrews, he gets pretty rough, by the way, because uh, it's like, you ever had that compliment sandwich and you know you're about to get scolded? Like they start with the compliment, they smack you with the thing you did wrong, and then like, but it's going to be all right. That's what the author of Hebrews does in chapter 10. He gave us a whole bunch of encouragement on how to live, and then he gives us a very strong warning about it. Uh, 10, 26, and 27, for if we deliberately go on sinning after receiving the knowledge of truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. But what? A terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of fire about to consume the adversaries. Strong language for sure, but don't worry. He comes back around with some, like, it's going to be okay. This is, this is how we live differently, though. We need to be serious about our life. So let me wrap this up. Here's what I believe about us, Summit. I really believe that we do things differently than other churches. And that's not to dig on other churches. There are some really incredible, great churches in St. Paul and all the surrounding suburbs. Absolutely incredible churches. Some of them are doing it better than us. Some are doing it the same as us. But I, just, I would just say that I, there is something unique about us, about you. There is something unique about you and the way that you want to love on this city and the way that you want to move forward in Christ. And I love being a part of you. I am so thankful to be a part of this mission. So let me echo what the author of Hebrews says at the end. This would be the, the second to last slide for those keeping track. Hebrews 10.39 But we are not those who draw back and are destroyed, but those who have faith and are saved. I I believe this about us, that we will not be the ones who draw back. Why? Because we will be bold as we enter into the presence of God. We will be bold to think differently. We will be bold to live differently. We will be bold to hold the conviction of our faith, and we will be bold together. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we have been, we have called us here. Thank you, God, 
Thank you that you have brought this church up almost 100 years ago for a time right now just like this and that you're preparing us for whatever you have 100 years from now. Thank you, Lord, for the, everyone in this space. God, I pray that you continue to craft us and to, and, and to mold us and to shape us into, into an accurate image of what it means to walk like Jesus. Help us to refrain from the things that you would rather us not do so that we can live into the reality of the freedom of just pursuing you with everything we have. And thank you that we can come before you even like this, even when we mess up, even when we make mistakes, even when our life has got a track record that would make a sailor whatever. Lord, we know that you have forgiven us and you have given us a way to be yours. So thank you, Jesus, for that. I just pray a blessing over all of those in this room, that as they leave out of here, that they are bold in their faith, they are bold to enter into your presence day by day, to think different, live different, be different, to love different together. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Love y'all. We'll see you next week as we go Hebrews 11. To help you apply the truth found in Scripture, we always like to ask three questions. What did you learn about God? What did you learn about yourself? And how are you going to apply what the Holy Spirit is speaking through Scripture to your life? We hope that these questions help bring clarity for you. Thank you for being a part of our online encounter. Join us in person sometime as we gather as a church on Summit Avenue. Or join us here virtually again next week. Let me just say, our city of St. Paul is absolutely amazing. I encourage you to check out all the history it has to offer. And you need to know Summit Church, this church has been a part of that history with so many amazing churches in our city. But speaking specifically about the people of Summit, well, we've been gathering here since 1932. And my hope is that this would be a rich history. It would be our forward legacy. History is a thing of the past, but legacy, it makes way you know, for the future. So the question I have for us is where are we going? Uh, that is a good question. Our vision is simple. It's really to see all of people and beyond living as disciples of Christ, people full of hope, uh, fully known, actively loving one another, living a spirit-led life. Our mission, it's also simple as well, to provide rhythm, location, opportunity for you to have a life-changing experience with God. Uh, you know, we all journey in our diversity to do these three things, become disciples of Jesus, deliver hope, and to champion our city. That's where we're going and that's what we're doing. So maybe a question for you is where are you going? You know, what are your next steps? I would encourage you to do this. Join one of our monthly expeditions. The expedition is a simple experience where you can find out more about who you are in Christ, who Summit Church is, what we do around here, and how you can maybe even, you know, play a part. It's less than two hours of your time uh, for the whole month. We also feed you amazing food and even provide child care. So the question is, where are you going? Hopefully to the expedition is my thought. We're all on a journey following Jesus, maybe together. We just might not be us without you. We'll see you at the summit.